Welcome to Family Church, Easter 2018. Welcome those in the overflow rooms. We wish we could have fit you in the room. We wish we had a bigger auditorium for everybody to come in and see it live. Today's reenactment, portrayal of Jesus being crucified on the cross, it was in no way to scare you or to add huge dramatic effect to the message that we were gonna preach. We wanted to show you a more true depiction of what the cross and crucifixion really was like. This song we did years and years ago, it was written in 1986 by a guy named Ray Bolt. It's called Watch the Lamb. I think every church did it in the early 90s. Um, it's kind of like a joke in, uh, in the church world that everybody did it, like 91, 92. Um, but we simply wanted to show you today a realistic distance to the cross. For some, I know it might be hard sitting here and watching Jesus hanging here and we wanted to make sure that we didn't do it too gruesome because if we really followed what the Bible said, nobody would want to sit here and look at that for a half hour. But today, I wanted to preach a message that would have been to me. Because as a kid, I had this vision of what it was like for Jesus being on the cross because of a song that we would sing. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, right? Anybody ever heard that song? And so I had this picture in my mind of Jesus on a hill far, far away, way up high on a cross, really high in the air, disconnected from humanity. And I think we get that from John 12, 32, where it says, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. It goes on to say that he said this to indicate how he was going to die, that he was going to die lifted onto a cross, that his arms would be stretched out upon a cross, and then one day he would be lifted into the heavens to be taken from us. So I always pictured a huge cross. And for years when we did our Easter walkthroughs, I'd build a bigger and bigger cross and put John Mark higher and higher in the air on the cross. He's been our Jesus for about 10 years. The only person brave enough to be naked in here today in front of all of you. But today, I wanna to tell you that Jesus was not on a hill far away. He was not hung on a cross 12 to 15 feet in the air where we could barely touch his feet. No, he was three to six inches off the ground where we could still touch his face. You see, his crucifixion was very, very near. It was very, very close. They hung him at this height for the torture of being one step away from catching their next breath. You see, Jesus most likely was not nailed to the cross with one foot over the other. In times, in these times, they would put their feet on either side of the cross and put two nails through their heels to hold them there. And to take their next breath, they would have to push up on that nail in their <gasps> to take that next breath. Because many times when they hung them on that cross, the drop of that beam into the post would dislocate their shoulder or their elbow. This was the torture that he endured. And I'm trying not to be too graphic, but I want you to see that he was one step away from catching his breath. He was one step away of going home to be with his family and have dinner Easter day or Good Friday. He was one step away of walking away from the situation yet he stayed fastened. The only one who had the power to raise himself off the cross chose to stay fastened to the cross. He did that for you and I. He was at this height also for the shame. You see, he didn't have this cute little garment wrapped around him. He would have been completely naked. From the time of his beating, walking through the city and hanging on the cross, 
he would have been completely stripped naked for the shame, for the humiliation. And I began to think, have we ever felt shame in our lives? Have we felt the shame of something that we did and we live with that in, the, in our minds and in our hearts? Maybe you feel shame from a failed marriage. Maybe you feel shame because your kid didn't turn out the way you thought they should turn out. Maybe you feel shame because you made decisions as a youth that turned out bad and caused heartache and pain for other people around you and you've lived your life with shame. For some of us, our greatest fear is to be naked in front of others. And I'm not just talking about physically naked. Some of us, our greatest fear is to be found emotionally naked, to be found out, that our secrets were found out, things about us were found out. We've done such a good job to protect our image but yet there's this fear on the other side. If anybody really knew who I was, if anybody really knew what I dealt with, if anybody really knew what I did, they wouldn't love me. They wouldn't accept me. And that's kind of what is happening here in this moment. Jesus is identifying with this. You see, he hung on the cross to free us from shame. In Hebrews 12 verse 1, it says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and run with endurance. It's kind of crazy to think trying to run an endurance race with a hundred pound beam on your back. See, that's what, that's what this shame does. This shame, this condemnation, this guilt weighs us down down. It slows us down so that we cannot fulfill the mission that God has placed in our lives. He says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Watch this. How? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. He goes on to say, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. You ready? Disregarding its shame. Disregarding the shame that would come with being crucified on the cross. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. He disregarded the shame, but he felt it. He disregarded the shame but he experienced it. He disregarded the shame, but he dealt with it so that we would not have to live shame-filled lives. This was a large part of the death penalty, the shame, the nakedness. Your friends and family watching on, powerless to do anything. Yet, for the joy that was set before him, he endured. The joy that was set before him was our freedom. We are the joy that was set before him. Our freedom, our, our ability to live shame-free was the joy that was set out before him. So he said, for you and you and you and you and for you, I'm willing to do this if you don't have to ever experience it in your own life. I want you to realize today that he is not a faraway God. I begin to think, why would people believe that he was a faraway God? Why would people believe that his crucifixion was on a hill far away, high on a cross? And it don't have because we want to believe that. People want to believe that I had nothing to do with it. I didn't do that. I didn't put Jesus on the cross. It's not my fault. Yeah, it is. It's your fault and 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 my fault. See, what we fail to realize is, see that one right there? That was me. I, I did that. 
You know, all those times when I knew to do right and I chose to do wrong. Those times when I willingly participated in something that was illegal or offensive to others. The time I bullied someone knowing that I could be the very vessel to stand up for that kid and I didn't. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, I'm healed. I can't imagine why people would want to believe in a faraway God who's far up in heaven, sitting on his big throne of judgment, convicting us and condemning us and commanding our lives. That's not what this is. This is the only God who left his throne to be like us, to experience what we would experience, to go through the very things that we would go through. And for some, you've been in church so long that even right now, this is just dulling. It's not even real to us. We've accepted a faraway God. Yet do you know the distance from where he received 39 lashes, where they ripped his back apart? From the place that he received the 39 lashes to the top of Golgotha's hill where his cross was mounted was only 200 yards away. Two football fields. The distance to the cross wasn't that far. And the distance to your Christ is not that far. And the distance to your answer is not that far. And the distance to your freedom is not that far. And the distance to your joy is not that far because he's near. He's near. He walked that 200 yards with a 100-pound beam on his back but it was the weight of the world. The weight of your sin, the weight of your shame, the weight of your sickness and disease he carried up Golgotha's hill, that slight incline. And he did it for that joy that was before him. If we would actually have seen Jesus at that moment, we would have seen what Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah 52, 14. He said, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. Now, we didn't need to show all those gruesome details. We did not put all sorts of makeup and stuff all over uh, our Jesus here today to to scare you or to give you that. It, this was enough. I think seeing it and feeling it, it, it was enough. What we wanted to see today is that he was not up on a hill far away. He is not in heaven far away, but he is here. Second Corinthians 3.17 says this, for the Lord is a spirit and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from whatever you're dealing with. There's freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. I want you to know today that His birth was near. His life was near. His ministry was near. The miracles he performed were near. His death was near. His resurrection was near. His ascension was near. And today, because he loves you and he loves me so much, his spirit is here. His spirit is with us. He is not a faraway God. The psalmist David said this of him. He said, God is as close to us 
as the mention of his name. Can we recognize today that the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is here for us today. Can, can, can we all visualize for a moment some of that shame that you've carried is right here. It's right, got your name written right on it. Now also for me, so let's just say this side was the shame, was the guilt, was the sin. This is my salvation. But me, I've been sick in my life. I've, I've been really sick. There were times I thought I was gonna die. I was in the hospital every single day getting blood tests done. I had track marks on my arms for, from as many blood tests as, as I was having done. I could not eat, I could not drink anything. So I had to drink water just to vomit it back up. And there were nights that I went to bed and I would say, please God, if you have mercy on me, if you love me, please don't let me wake up tomorrow. Because I knew what waking up the next day was gonna be. You know what? This one right here. That was my healing. That was my healing. I know, I know, I have documentation that says I had a disease that I don't live with today because by his stripes, I am healed. Forgiveness here, healing here. He took it on his body. So I don't have to live that way and you don't have to live that way. But here's the catch. I heard of people who've been in church their whole lives. And if I get a little bit emotional, it's just because I know, I know the truth that I live. I've heard of people their whole lives who they've gone to church and they agree with what the preacher says, but they've never actually asked God into their life. That they've never actually asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior and to be in their life. You see, mental assent is not the same as salvation. Agreeing with a belief system is not the same as accepting a belief system and living your life accordingly. It's not the same thing. And I can't imagine knowing and fully accepting what this man did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. That it wouldn't take us to a place and compel us to a place that says, listen, I give my life for this. It takes more than just saying, okay, I agree. You're right. It says, I believe. I believe that I need this Christ in my life. So today, we're going to do a two-part prayer. The first part is this. Today, I want to pray for those who are already believers. You have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But you've gotten stale. You've lost the joy of salvation. You've lost the twinkle in your eye. For that, you can remember back to those first few weeks when you first accepted Jesus, how excited you were and how many people you were telling about the goodness of God, the decision you made, and you can't remember the last time you were excited to even go to church. You've kind of lost that edge. You've lost that excitement. You've lost the reason that you call yourself a Christian and the reason why I call myself a Christian. That's not condemnation at all. I wanna give you hope. And part of my calling is to ignite a passion for the Lord. So I wanna pray with all those believers this morning. Father, we thank you for sending us your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Let today help us remember why we believed in the first place. Lord, I thank you this year as we stripped all the technology away and just told a simple story that the simplicity of the gospel, 
the simplicity of the crucifixion and the simplicity of the resurrection is enough to reignite and rekindle the flames that are within us. That we can be a light to this dark generation. That we can be a light to those around us. That we can be, speak truth in love. And through us, God, people will be drawn to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. The second part is this. Maybe you're in here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. I want to show you today what difference it makes when you ask him into your life. You see, before Jesus, I put these nails here, and I put these stripes here, and I put that nail there. But when I say, will you be my Lord and Savior? Will you come into my life? Will you save me and make me new? I accept what he did for me. And I bring him into my life. And I walk with him. And I talk with him. And he tells me, you'll never be alone. You may feel abandoned. You may feel hurt. You may feel, feel, feel a far away from others around you. But he said, I will stick closer to you than a brother. Will you let me in? Will you let me into your heart? Will you let me into your life? Will you let me into those dark places and those secret places that you're afraid of being found out? Because he knows about them already. He says, I won't, I won't hold it against you, but I'll hold you. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to accept Christ into your life, we want to offer that to you today. And here at Family Church, we all pray together. And the prayer goes just like this, if you repeat after me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross and he rose for me. Jesus, I accept you now into my life to change me and to make me new. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that for the first time, would you raise your hand real quick so we could identify with you? Anybody in here today? Over there, amen. Anybody else? In the middle, amen. In the back, praise God. How about in the overflow rooms? If you're in the overflow room, raise your hand so somebody can see you. If you prayed that for the first time, we ask, you don't have to do it, but we encourage you. There's a card on the seat back in front of you. You can text Jesus to the number on that card and someone will get back to you. Or you can fill that card out and we have tables set up in the lobby with balloons on them where someone would love to connect with you and give you a book that we wrote here at Family Church that talks about salvation and, and your journey with the Lord. We would be so uh, excited and encouraged if you would just stop by there. If you're new here, you can do the same exact thing. You can text or fill out that card and someone at that desk is just chomping at the bit to give you a hug, a high five, a handshake, whatever your comfort zone is. Um, and we would love to meet you today. We also would like to invite you back next Sunday, different time, same place. 8.30, 10 o'clock and 11 th uh, 11.30. And I will not be dressed like this next week. I'll be back to normal clothes. But let's close in prayer. Let me bless you. Father, we thank you and praise you for a word spoken into our lives today. We thank you, Lord, that your word is alive and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's the only thing that brings death into life. We thank you, Lord. I bless everyone in the sound of my voice, those in the overflow rooms and here in the main auditorium, that they are the head and not the tail, above and never beneath. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. Happy Easter.